clinical hypothyroidism. Want to treat? Please, Dr. Rasha. Okay. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بشكر الأستاذة الجميلة حبيبتي دكتور علياء على دعوتي بشكر دكتور تامر الزميل والأخ العزيز ودكتورة جيهان على مجهودها معايا مبسوطة جدا بوجودي في سايرو أليكس وفي وجودي مع حضراتكم وعقبال كل سنة يا رب دايما هتكلم عن طابق زي ما دكتورة علياء قدمت اللي هو سب كلينيكال هايبو ثيرويديزم أنا شيرينج السكرين تمام كده شغال. And I'll try to answer the question. Well, here it's a difficult question that we all face in our clinics to treat or not to treat. We all know the classification of hypothyroidism, whether subclinical, primary, or secondary. And as we know, the definition of subclinical hypothyroidism is an elevated TSH with a normal T4. In children, it's usually asymptomatic, and usually it is a biochemical diagnosis. So uh, when facing a child with subclinical hypothyroidism, the questions that come to our mind are, is it transient and will resolve? Could it progress to overt hypothyroidism? to treat or not to treat, the most difficult question. And if you decide to treat, is it a lifelong treatment or shall we stop? Another difficult question that parents ask, is it transient or for life? Actually, half of the cases remain as subclinical hypothyroidism. Only 10% progress to overt hypothyroidism, while 40%, which is a good percent, will revert to euthyroidism. So the percentage is quite difficult from adults. And looking at the course and the causes of subclinical hypothyroidism in children, of course, by far, Hashimoto thyroiditis is the most common cause. But here in the box on the right side, you can see a very long list of other causes, including idiopathic. Please remember that idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism is usually self-limiting. We do not treat it a lot. And subclinical hypothyroidism as a part of Hashimoto thyroiditis or associated with other autoimmune disease or chromosomal aberrations usually progresses to overt hypothyroidism and it usually requires treatment. Another important point you see here in the box on the left side, there is a very long list of drugs that could interfere with thyroid function in children and adolescents. So please remember to exclude drug intake in any child or adolescent with clinical hypothyroidism, for example, anti-epileptics could be a cause. Another question, is there a long-term sequelae of subclinical hypothyroidism in children? Could it affect the bone mineral density? Does it have any metabolic complications? Does it have any neurocognitive effects on children? And finally, will it affect growth or not? Now, this is a study published in Pediatrics International reporting height improvement by L-thyroxine in patients with subclinical hypothyroidism, as you see here, and they concluded that patients with short stature should be screened and evaluated for subclinical hypothyroidism in addition to potential causes. So it's part of the workup of a child with short stature. Uh, another paper, assessed the neurocognitive function in children and adolescents with subclinical hypothyroidism. And what they found is that there was an affection in their attention. They had some school problems, but it did not clearly affect the IQ. Another study focused on idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism. And here you can see in this box, there was no significant difference in the verbal IQ, the performance, and the full scale IQ between patients with subclinical hypothyroidism and controls. And the conclusion was that idiopathic type of subclinical hypothyroidism does not affect growth or neuropsychological function. So this is with idiopathic. We all know that thyroid dysfunction raises the risk of osteoporosis and fractures. In case of hypothyroidism, the mechanism is a low bone turnover, so it could predispose to brittle bones. Now, this is a study published in 2017, and this study found that bone mineral density was lower in 
patients with subclinical hypothyroidism and that the bone mineral density improved after thyroxin treatment. Now, this was not the case in patients with idiopathic type. A study published in Italian Journal of Pediatrics looked into the bone health in children with idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism. What they concluded was that the bone health evaluated by DEXA scan was not impaired in children with idiopathic type. So again, idiopathic type is a special entity that does not have long-term effect in children. But yet they decided that annual screening by DEXA scan is still advisable. We all know that there are a lot of metabolic aspects of thyroid hormones in childhood and that thyroid dysfunction could affect the metabolic status, whether hypo or hyper. And the question, does long-standing subclinical hypothyroidism predispose to metabolic syndrome or not? In the past, we used to say yes in adults, but not in children. Now, recently, some publications found associations in children as well as a long-term sequelae. And the mechanism here predisposing to cardiovascular effects are hypertension, inflammation, dyslipidemia, hypercoagulable state, endothelial dysfunction, hyperhomocysteinemia, and finally, increased lipoprotein A. So indeed, there is a mechanism in children as well. Now, this is a very recent study published in 2019, evaluating cardiovascular risk factor in children with subclinical hypothyroidism. And what they found is that there is diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle in untreated cases in those children, and therefore they recommended cardiac follow-up in children with subclinical hypothyroidism. Obesity, a very common thing that we see now. Obesity aggravates the situation more. Obesity predisposes to subclinical hypothyroidism, leading to metabolic syndrome, and the vicious circle goes on. And the question, what is the link between obesity and subclinical hypothyroidism? Simply, increased fat mass increases the serum leptin, causing a rise in TSH with subclinical hypothyroidism. Also, increased fat-free mass increases the T4 disposal, causing lowering of the T4 with a compensatory rise in the TSH, which in turn tries to normalize the T4 secretion again. Also, obesity increases the free fatty acids and inflammation, creating insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, ending up by subclinical hypothyroidism, which in turn aggravates more and more insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, leading to a vicious circle. So indeed, subclinical hypothyroidism and obesity are closely related. Now, this is an article published in 2017, comparing subclinical hypothyroidism prevalence in lean and obese children. And they found a higher prevalence of subclinical hypothyroidism in obese. And central obesity by itself, independent of the overall degree of obesity, augments the risk of concurrent subclinical hypothyroidism. So indeed, there is a clear relation with features of metabolic syndrome. Another very recent article published in 2019 tested the relation between components of metabolic syndrome syndrome and subclinical hypothyroidism in adolescence. And what they found is that abdominal obesity and hypertension were higher in children and adolescents with subclinical hypothyroidism than in new thyroid subjects. Another article in Journal of Pediatrics and Child Health tested the prevalence of subclinical hypothyroidism in obese, and they found a very close correlation between the degree of dyslipidemia and the rise in the TSH level. So indeed, it is related. Another article found a very close association between non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLA, as a predisposing factor and a cardiovascular risk factor associated with thyroid dysfunction. And that thyroid dysfunction might play a role in the pathogenesis of NAFLA. 
Indeed, clinical hypothyroidism predisposes to NAFLUD by increasing hepatic insulin resistance via a rise in the leptin, FGF1, and lowering of lipoprotein lipase activity. So it's clear that all components of metabolic syndrome are related to subclinical hypothyroidism with various degrees. Now, coming to the most difficult question, the very controversial question, to treat or not to treat a child with subclinical hypothyroidism. In other way, which way shall we go? Shall we give thyroxine or wait? Unfortunately, till now, there is no clear consensus, and I'm going to show you different papers and arguments on that. Now, let's start with the story of this boy, a very common scenario that we see at our clinics. This is an eight-year-old boy whose weight and height are normal, negative family history of thyroid disease. The boy is asymptomatic. He does not have goiter. His TSH is 7.8. His T4 is normal, antibodies are negative, and thyroid ultrasound is normal. So the only finding is a high TSH. What would you like to do for this boy? Please vote with me and let's take the first voting question. What would you like to do for this boy? Would you like to start L-thyroxine or follow up the thyroid function after three months or no further follow-up is needed. Just let the boy go home and nothing else is needed. Please help me with that boy. Yes, thank you very much. Most of you, 94% got the correct answer. Yes, we do not need to start thyroxine because the TSH did not exceed 10 and the boy does not have any risk factor. So this is what we did really with that boy. Now the boy came six months later with the same data but this time the TSH jumped to 12.2. Now what would you like to do for this boy at this stage? Please help me and vote with me. Would you like to start L-thyroxine? Again another three months of follow-up for this boy or no further follow-up is needed. Let him go home. What would you like to do? Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, this is what we would do. The TSH exceeded 10. We have to start treatment even if there aren't any risk factors. And yes, this is what we did. Now, let's take another story. A 10-year-old boy. His weight is slightly overweight. He is in the high normal of the weight and in the low normal for the height. He's not short, but in the low normal. His maternal aunt has got Graves' disease. He's asymptomatic. He has goiter grade 2. His TSH is 8.9, normal T4. His thyroid antibodies are positive. The thyroid ultrasound revealed a goiter with heterogeneous echo texture. What would you like to do for this boy? Please help me and vote with me. Would you like to start L-thyroxine treatment, follow up the thyroid functions after three months, or no further follow-up is needed? Please vote. Thank you very much. Yes, in spite of the fact that the TSH is not too high, but the boy has got a lot of risk factors. His height is not ideal, he's slightly overweight, he has history of autoimmunity and his antibodies are positive and the ultrasound, there is a thyroid pathology. Indeed, we have to start treatment and this is what we did with that boy. Now, another different story, seven-year-old obese girl. She developed progressive weight gain and she's eating a lot. She doesn't have a healthy lifestyle, but she's very tall. Remember, this time the girl is very tall. She has a negative family history of thyroid disease. She does not have goiter. Her T4 is normal. The TSH is 8.11. Antibodies are negative and thyroid ultrasound is normal. Now help me in managing this girl. What would you like to do for this girl? Please vote with me. Would you like to start L-thyroxine treatment or advise weight loss and follow up the thyroid functions after another three months or no further follow-up is needed. Please vote. 
Yes, thank you very much. Of course, we have to advise weight loss because as we said, obesity triggers subclinical hypothyroidism and once she loses weight, she could normalize her thyroid function. And this is what happened when I saw the girl six months later, she was put on a healthy lifestyle. The TSH went down 4.6 without starting treatment. Another totally different spectrum of the story. A 13 and a half year old girl, she came with a short stature. She's very short, minus three and a half standard deviation, delayed puberty, tatter one. Her weight is normal. She's dysmorphic. She was born with a low birth weight and length, swelling of dorsa of hands and feet, mathematical problems at school, and she has recurrent otitis media. And this is the growth chart of the girl. She was born short since birth, infancy, childhood, adolescence. She's always short till the time I met that girl. Her T4 is normal. The TSH is in the high normal. Her growth hormone stimulation by clonidine is normal. Celiac screening proved positive and confirmed by biopsy. The bone age is delayed. And look at the GnRH stimulation test. The girl has delayed puberty. We did the test. There was a very high FSH, high LH, low estradiol. The girl has got hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. So there is a problem with her ovaries. And by screening ultrasound, because she's dysmorphic, we found a partial horseshoe kidney and the echo was normal. What's the missing investigation that was not done in that girl? Indeed, you all agree, the karyotype. And this was found to be a 45X Turner syndrome girl. Now, we started growth hormone and sex steroid and she was put on a gluten-free diet. She catched up her growth and she started her puberty. She's doing very well, but unfortunately, again, she plateaued her height. Poor growth velocity and pubertal arrest B2. Now. We re-evaluated the girl. The T4 this time was found to be normal and the TSH jumped to 8.5. So this is a subclinical hypothyroidism. Antibodies are positive. The bone age is more delayed than before. Three years, what would you like to do for this Turner girl with subclinical hypothyroidism? Please help me and vote. Would you like to start L-thyroxine? Follow up thyroid functions after three months, or no further follow-up is needed for this girl. Please vote. Excellent, thank you very much. All of you nearly got the correct answer. Yes, we have to start L-thyroxine. Turner syndrome by itself is a risk factor for overt hypothyroidism. The girl has got celiac disease and autoimmune disease. She has positive antibodies. She's very short. She arrested her puberty. Yes, we have to start thyroxine treatment. Okay, here we added L-thyroxine and what happened? She catched up her growth and resumed her puberty and she's doing very well. Now let's have a look on these guidelines recently published in Frontiers in Endocrinology and the title was Subclinical Hypothyroidism in Children When Replacement Hormonal Therapy Might Be Advisable. And the statement that they put was that treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism is controversial in children. And they put this question clearly, when to treat a child with subclinical hypothyroidism, the answer was if there is a high risk of progression to overt hypothyroidism. And in the two boxes, you can clearly see, based on these guidelines, 2019, the high risk and the low risk. The high risk in red, hypothyroidism related subclinical hypothyroidism when there is a pathology. But as we said, if it is idiopathic, don't treat, it's self-limiting, except if the TSH is more than 10. Another high risk, the baseline TSH more than 10, positive and rising antibodies, the presence of goiter, syndromes like Turner and Down syndrome, associated autoimmune disease like celiac disease, prepubertal at diagnosis, and female sex. Now, the baseline TSH level is the most powerful predictor for progression of subclinical hypothyroidism to overt hypothyroidism. Once you have a TSH of more than 10, you have to start treatment, whatever the etiology, even if idiopathic. But the treatment remains a matter of debate for values between 5 and 10. Increased cardiovascular risk factor morbidities are present if the TSH is above 10, so you have to treat above 10. What about the etiology? As we said, idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism is self-limiting. Don't treat it, except if the case is above 10 for the TSH. 
while if there is a thyroid pathology, worsening of thyroid status is more frequent, especially if there is associated autoimmunities like celiac or associated risk factors or syndromes. Another thing is that treating children with hypothyroidism related subclinical hypothyroidism should not be under any debate if the TSH is above 10 and there is a thyroid pathology because this predisposes to a carcinogenic risk. So again, you have to weigh matters very well. Now, let me share with you the guidelines proposed by American Thyroid Association for treatment of children with, and adolescents with subclinical hypothyroidism. Again, the same question and the same answer, to treat or not to treat. Again and again, it is still controversial in children. But they put very clear recommendations when to treat and when not to treat with a gray zone in between. You must treat if TSH is more than 10 if the patient is clearly symptomatic, if there is high risk of progression to avert hypothyroidism, the red box that we have seen, and in adults if there's pregnancy or infertility. And they recommended against treatment if the TSH is from 5 to 10 in a child, especially if there are negative antibodies, idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism, if there is no goiter, asymptomatic, or if there is no thyroid pathology by ultrasound. But in such a case, don't let the patient go home. Follow up thyroid functions every three to six months. If stable, you can follow up annually. What about the gray zone that we all face? Not so clear. Consider treatment. You should weigh matters. If TSH is more than two times the upper limit, more than eight. Progressive rise in the TSH positive antibodies, goiter, child or adolescent with short stature, dyslipidemia or cardiovascular risk factors, thyroid pathology by ultrasound. So this is the gray zone. Here you have to balance it and treat on individual basis according to the situation of each child as I've showed you in the cases that we presented. So you have to put the benefits and the drawbacks, the pros and the cons, and weigh matters for each individual patient. And there are some tips to remember. Always start with a very small dose thyroxine to avoid side effects. 25 to 50 micrograms a day in children. Adjust the dose by playing in 12 and a half micrograms increase or decrease. Repeat the thyroid functions after four to six weeks and then every three months when normal and then annually if antibodies are positive or every three years if negative. It's very important to tailor according to each patient. And this is how the pediatric workup should go for subclinical hypothyroidism. And on the right side, this is a very simple algorithm of how to think about cases of subclinical hypothyroidism. We do thyroid functions, antibodies, ultrasound, look for symptoms, goiter, complications, ask about the family history and exclude a lot of things, including syndromes, chromosomal aberrations, and chronic illness and obesity. Now, this is a case of a 10-year-old girl who came with this midline neck swelling since two years. The swelling is cystic, not tender, moves with swallowing and protrusion of the tongue. She doesn't have any pain or discharge or lymphadenopathy, and she's totally asymptomatic. And when we did the thyroid functions, we found subclinical hypothyroidism. The TSH is 11.9. The T4 is normal, and the antibodies are negative. And when we did an ultrasound, we found a multi-septated anechoic cystic lesion and the thyroid gland was not visualized in the thyroid fossa. Now, what is the next step for this girl? Please vote with me and help me in managing that girl. Would you like to repeat the thyroid ultrasound after three months or repeat the thyroid functions after three months? Or would you like to do a thyroid scan to look for the missing thyroid that we did not see at its bed? Please vote. Thank you very much. Yes, more than 85% got the correct answer. Yes, we should look for the thyroid. Whenever you cannot see the thyroid by ultrasound, you must do a thyroid scan to exclude ectopia. And this is what we found. We found ectopic thyroid in hyoid and inside the thyroglossal cyst. 
and there was an absent uptake of the thyroid in its normal bed. This was confirmed by CT, and remember, when you have ectopic thyroid inside thyroglossal cyst, there is a minimal risk of carcinoma that should be excluded. So we have a girl with ectopic thyroid in thyroglossal cyst and infrahyoid. What would you like to do as a management for this girl? Please help me and vote with me. Would you like to do surgical excision of the thyroglossal cyst and start L-thyroxine or follow up thyroid functions and ultrasound after three months to see what's happening or start thyroxine and you don't like to do surgery, postpone surgery? What would you like to do for this girl? A case of thyroglossal cyst with ectopic thyroid tissue in the cyst. Yes, thank you very much. Nearly 85% got the correct answer. Yes, we have to remove the thyroglossal cyst. It's liable to infection. It's carcinogenic with the presence of ectopic tissue inside. And we should start L-thyroxine because the TSH is high. In infants, the situation is even more critical. Take care not to slip. This is an eight-day-old neonate with uneventful birth history. He was born with normal weight and length. The baby is totally asymptomatic. The TSH was found to be high on neonatal screening, 14. What would you like to do for this neonate? Yes, vote with me, please. The TSH is 14, the baby is asymptomatic. Would you like to start thyroxine? Follow up thyroid function after two weeks and do thyroid ultrasound to look for the thyroid or no further follow-up is needed. Let the baby go home in peace. What would you like to do? Yes, thank you very much. Most of you got the correct answer. The correct answer is to follow up the thyroid after two weeks and do an ultrasound. Some of you said we will treat. We do not treat if the TSH did not exceed 20 in an infant. And this is a very important point. It's different from children. Now, let me share with you the guidelines proposed by European Society for Pediatric Endocrinology published in JCM. And they wrote a very nice article on how to deal with infants with congenital hypothyroidism. And here you can see that more than 40 TSH, you must start treatment with imaging. If the TSH is more than 20, again, you must start. If the T4 is below the normal, you must start. What about this gray zone? If the TSH is from 6 to 20, this is the gray zone that I showed you in this baby. You have to retest thyroid functions after two weeks and do imaging to exclude congenital anomalies of the thyroid. Start by ultrasound. If you cannot see it, do a thyroid scan. And this is what we did for the baby. Two weeks later, the baby came with a TSH of 22. It jumped and the thyroid ultrasound revealed right thyroid lobe hemiagenesis. There is a thyroid abnormality. What would you like to do for this baby? Please vote with me. Would you like to start L-thyroxine at this point? Follow up the thyroid functions for another two weeks and repeat the thyroid ultrasound or no further follow-up is needed. The baby is asymptomatic, no problem, let him go home. What would you like to do? Yes, excellent, more than 95%. Thank you very much. You have to start the treatment. If the TSH exceeds 20 and there is a definite pathology by ultrasound, we have to start treatment. Okay, so decision of treatment is controversial and this is the gray zone in infant, a TSH of six to 20. And in this article, published, uh, uh, proposed by European Society of Pediatric Endocrine Team, they proposed that infants with mild subclinical hypothyroidism, 72% resolve spontaneously, and that's why it's safe to wait for two weeks. The indications of starting treatment after waiting for the two weeks, if persistent TSH rise more than 10 for more than four weeks, or if there are clear symptoms of hypothyroidism, or if there is a clear thyroid dysgenesis or abnormality like ectopia, because here there are concerns about neurodevelopment and growth. My last case is a 14-year-old girl with chronic kidney disease. Since four years, she's on regular hemodialysis. She's asymptomatic, but she developed goiter grade two. Her TSH is 8.2. Her antibodies are negative. T3 and T4 are normal. Ultrasound showed homogeneous enlarged thyroid with no definite thyroid pathology. So we have a case of subclinical hypothyroidism associating chronic kidney disease. Now, what is the next step for this girl with chronic kidney disease? 
please vote with me and help me in managing that girl. Would you like to start L-thyroxine, follow up thyroid functions after two to three months, or no further follow-up is needed in that girl? Really controversial issue. What would you like to do? Yes, nearly half and half. Half of you said, yes, both could be correct. Half of you said, follow up the thyroid function after two to three months, and this is what I would honestly do. And the other half said, okay, start treatment. Both of them could be correct. But now let's see here. So clinical hypothyroidism and chronic kidney disease to treat or not to treat. Actually, there is lack of consensus what to do in such case, but there are attentive unnecessary thyroid hormone replacement in asymptomatic cases could lead to excess muscle catabolism and negative nitrogen balance, which could worsen the situation. Sometimes the subclinical hypothyroidism in these cases is a matter of compensatory mechanism for these cases, so don't rush to treat. And the guidelines here are no need to treat subclinical hypothyroidism in patients with chronic kidney disease if the TSH is less than 10, except if symptomatic. In that girl, she's not symptomatic and the TSH is less than 10. So there is no need to rush for treatment, but no harm in giving a low dose. If you decide to treat, start with a very low dose and monitor the cardiac function. This is a nice article published in JCM. Again, they said the same, the cutoff of 10 for TSH was proposed to treat patients with subclinical hypothyroidism and kidney disease. My final conclusions are subclinical hypothyroidism is less common in children than adults. Generally speaking, most of pediatric subclinical hypothyroid cases resolve spontaneously. The decision of treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism in children is highly controversial, even in largest societies and in all references. Children with a TSH of more than 10 must be treated, whatever the cause. But children with a TSH of 5 to 10 are treated on individual basis based on the risk factors that we have mentioned. Children with idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism are self-limiting and do not need treatment. Children with thyroid pathology require treatment and follow-up. Obesity-related subclinical hypothyroidism needs follow-up and weight loss. Don't rush for treatment. And finally, infants with borderline TSH levels need close follow-up and imaging. And this is the pediatric subclinical hypothyroidism in a nutshell a slide summing up all what we have said. Thank you very much for your attention.